This time, John and Scoop welcome our friends Tiffany Lee Brown and Jane Hirschfield back to the Plutopia podcast. In this pre-holiday episode, we discuss ways in which we might survive and flourish during stressful or dangerous times. We usually open with a short clip featuring an interesting comment from our guests. There were so many great comments by all four participants, I couldn't decide which ones to feature. With that out of the way, I'll leave it to John to get us started. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of the Plutopia News Network. I'm John Lebkowski, and my partner out in the woods over there is uh, Scoop Sweeney. And we're brought together in cyberspace by the miracle of bits and bytes. Our guests today are Tiffany Lee Brown, a writer and interdisciplinary artist who lives out in the woods of Oregon. And Jane Hirschfield, an award-winning poet, translator, essayist, and editor. And they're just going to talk to us today about well, what I wrote here is maybe we'll talk about how to stay sane in a crazy time. What do you think about that? Sounds good. All right. Well, I think it's fine, but I'm going to say talk with us because we expect you to be an equal part of the conversation. Oh, we will, we will be. Scoop and I will be obnoxiously present. Sometimes you can't shut us up, so be careful what you ask for. Yeah. <laughs> But we did talk uh, before uh, today about opening with one of your poems, Jane, a poem called Let Them Not Say. Do you feel like reading that to us now? I would be happy to. And the other thing, since, you know, we we did share some emails ahead of time. And besides talking about how to say stay sane, one of the things I think we're going to be talking about is... Um, how to have real conversations as part of staying sane. Absolutely. And so for reading this poem, I'm going to um, introduce it by saying that in it, I am having a conversation with the future, which is after all, a part of our larger community. And I am imagining in this poem, uh, the future looking back on us at this pivotal moment in the fate of, you know, not only a country, but of the biosphere of the of the earth as it as it currently is constellated. And I was imagining, you know, they're going to look back on us and they're going to know how we did. And the poem is in a way a spell against what it ends up saying, in that it hoped by saying it, that it would make what it says something that the future will go, oh, what was she so worried about? Um, so it began as a poem written originally as a poem about the crisis of the biosphere, climate change, toxins, extinctions, everything we are doing to uh, our fellow creatures and the planet. Um, but when it was published, it ended up being published as a political poem. It ended up being published uh, rather broadly on the day of the first inauguration of our now again incoming administration. And uh, for a long time, it lived as a political poem. And then as time went on, you know, it's been eight years, uh, it returned to being a poem about uh, environmental thoughts and ponderings and activisms. And, you know, in both those realms, it's become a bit of an anthem for which you know any writer is very grateful to feel they can contribute anything to a conversation. So with that long preface, here's the poem. Let them not say. Let them not say we did not see it. We saw. Let them not say we did not hear it. We heard. Let them not say they did not taste it. We ate. We trembled. Let them not say it was not spoken, not written. We spoke. We witnessed with voices and hands. Let them not say they did nothing. We did not enough. Let them say, as they must say something, a kerosene beauty. It burned. Let them say we warmed ourselves by it. 
read by its light, praised, and it burned. Thank you. And as I say thanks, I will also mention this is our Thanksgiving show. So we can also talk about being thankful. Yes, we can. And one thing that poem does is express, you know, even as our fossil fuels um, do their do their increasing damage because of the quantity with which we burn things, you know, life itself is a burning. Um, you know, that poem tries to remember my own gratitude that I can read in the dark, you know, that I can be warm. I am complicit in the damage, but we also all find the radiance of this earth and of our lives because our own bodies are burning, the sun is burning, and everything between that lives is in one way or another casting its light, flame, heat, and transformation of one element into another. You know, oxygen, carbon dioxide, in a, in a, in a right balance, this trading back and forth is what we are. Okay, end of pontificating, on to the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I get that. I mean, from a Buddhist perspective, perspective we're, we're in a state of flow, and we're constantly flowing, and we're constantly changing. And uh, no, no single thing is permanent. Nothing is permanent. I mean, we could talk about the Buddhist concept of emptiness. We'd probably hurt our heads if we did. But, but you kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, I don't know. T, what do you think? What do I think? Um, I actually read this poem, Jane's poem, "Let Them Not Say," to myself. Uh, I don't know, last week or something. And as she began, I forgot like, oh my God, this poem always makes me cry. Talking about the poem is making me cry. Um, it's so powerful. And giving voice to these things is really powerful in itself. Perhaps a sanity maker, perhaps uh, sometimes leads us deeper, deeper into issues that may depress the heck out of us or um initiate an underworld journey and sometimes that's what's required and i feel like in my work that's really i guess become a huge focus over the years is uh how do we how do we go in and really whatever sit with underworld journey everybody's got their own language around it go into the dark go into the depths not fearlessly, but nevertheless with courage. And this is an exercise in spirit and emotion, intellect, body, the whole shebang. Um, you know, and hopefully you get through it, you don't get caught at the bottom, you know, at the, in Chapel Perilous, at the pit of despair, um, the long, dark tea time of the soul, you know, you want to pop out of it at some point and find that it's enabling you to swim. And I was eating a pomegranate last night, you know, and it's that season here in the Northern Hemisphere. So was I. Going underground. <laughs> yeah. Persephone eating, eating the pomegranate uh, and acknowledging, just acknowledging that sometimes you need to go through some hell and that, as you guys were saying about change and burning and transforming, I think we sometimes make the mistake of imagining that we can or should control how this delving and darkening and opening, like what they should result in when we come out the other side. And that, that kind of ruins the whole thing. Like we're in it for openness, for testing our courage, for finding out what there is to find out, which may completely rock our little limited worlds and make us make us think differently about ourselves and our countrymen, et cetera. You have yeah. brought fantastic um, enlarged perspective with those comments. 
to the navigation of uh, what for many of us is a difficult time to be looking into in our immediate future. I want to ask you, just because it kind of fits with things, even though it's a tiny bit of a detour, um, you know, right there on your identification, uh, burning tarot is is what you call the work you do with tarot. Can you say something about your understanding of why you chose that? Here, look, I even have an ad. Well, you can't. It says burning tarot on this mug. This is my friend Steve, who used to be my one of my burning tarot collaborators. This is one of his burning photos. And my water, the other one's the tea. Um, so Burning Tarot actually emerged, emerged out of the Burning Man Festival. So I had been reading tarot already for many, many years and then started a project to turn Burning Man participants into a tarot deck. And then it just kind of grew from there. It became this giant art installation that looked like you were in a womb and I was attached to it and I'm giving you tarot reading. This is weird. We made a couple of different tarot decks. And then at the beginning of the pandemic, I started the Burning Tarot podcast. And, you know, I, I guess I just already had that name and I had picked up a copy of the deck and we were in such stressful, weird, transformative times that I didn't even think about it. I was just like, oh, it's time to revive something about Burning Tarot. And I had want, I wanted to, so there's like little audio journeys where you get to read a tarot card, go on a nature walk. I describe, you know, all this beautiful stuff. So that was for my friends who were trapped in apartments in cities. It was pretty specifically intended to try to give them some comfort. Um, so I would like to say that, that, you know, burning tarot is especially for these times, but it, you know what, all that art and woo woo energy that goes into major transformation and that, uh, causes us to become very conscious of it. It's all woven together for me. So there you go. Great. I answer. have a question. Um, you know, we're, we've been talking, especially it's for the last week or so, all, a lot of us have been talking about how, you know, we're in these difficult times, these frightening times and so forth. Um, before that, before something that happened, the election, and we're not going to talk about the election that much, but we know there's been a kind of sea change lately. And uh, Maybe we weren't saying that or thinking that as much, but I, I just wonder if anything has really changed. Are we in, and I'm thinking about, I guess I'm thinking about how much we don't know. I'm kind of coming from don't know mind, you know. Um, we have slices of things that we see. I, I was thinking about this as you read the poem, Jane, you know, uh, about what we saw and what we heard and what we tasted, and there's always a limit. And so much of our experience of our lives and our reality right now are based on exposure to, I don't know, various sources of media. We're all very media driven these days. I mean, among us, I know we all are. But I just, I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is how do we get at what's really going on? And one of the things that I've been advocating is that we find some way to create um, deeper forms of community, you know, something different from social media, more like we all, uh, well, three of the four of us are on the well and have an experience of community there that we know has real depth and compared to social media, it's like a really different experience. And I've been thinking that it would be helpful if more people could have that depth of experience versus spending so much time with their social media apps. Um, but then I think about how there, 
there's a constraint on scaling communities. You can't really, I mean, beyond a certain number of people, it's hard to have the same sense of community and they tend to chunk into smaller communities. And then the question is, what does that serve? Does that just create a lot of bubbles where people are only exposed are mostly exposed to the thoughts and and uh, um, perceptions of that smaller community of people, and and does that mean that it would be even more polarizing? Well, if I could uh, join in about the whole thing that we just experienced in the uh, recent election, uh, it wasn't my first election or second or third. I started out. Uh, in media as a radio news reporter, and I ended up as a uh, news director for the Pacifica radio station in Houston, Texas. We were bombed off the air twice by the Ku Klux Klan, so obviously we were not a uh, uh, mainstream media. We were out there in left fields, literally, and Richard Nixon was reelected as I, I in my as I started my second year as news director, and being in a place like Houston, which was very very conservative, I figured it was time to get out of town, and I of course moved to Berkeley, and hooked up with Pacifica Radio there, and that was my sheltering from the storm. Uh, procedure and i've done it a few times and then i ended up doing it again because the bay area became unlivable uh for many reasons mostly financial and i came back to texas so sometimes you just have to get out of town yeah that doesn't say that that's a, a good solution for everyone but i found it saved my sanity by just getting away from a place that was just heavily ingrained in the ultra conservative, uh, ultra Nixon world of Houston and coming to a place like Berkeley, which at that time, and this was 1973, it was just a hotbed of hot alternative media. I got to hang out with people that, uh, had uh, worshiped from afar who were doing great media and got to participate in that so that saved my soul but yeah you know, any you know, some people might say you know i was a coward and i ran away well sure i had to, I had to save my sanity well that is so interesting um because of course it's one of one of the many conversations going around is people wondering you know uh how do you know when it's time to leave? Um, but also, of course, so you, so you came to uh, the Bay Area one year before I did. I, I arrived in 1974, uh, a little younger than you, I think, in a red Dodge van with tie-dyed curtains looking for my future, which uh, to my own uh, not expectation, speaking of uh, John's earlier saying, let's remember uncertainty, let's remember that we don't know what's going to happen, I ended up uh, doing eight years of formal Zen training. Um, you, you had a red Dodge van. I had a red Dodge van. Yeah, everybody I, turns it I, into. I came out in a. I came out in a white Dodge van. Oh well, all right. And did they but I had a, I had a Native dogs? American blanket hanging in the back. I didn't have any tie. Yes, yes, and I had tie dyed curtains that I had made myself. One of the only sewing projects of my life. <laughs> um, but you know, one of the things about the difference between now and the early 70s is a person who feels isolated in Houston, they can go online. They can find kindred spirits who they are not necessarily going to meet by accident in the grocery store. So that's a huge cultural change. You know, it's like, John, you asked so many questions in your question. It's hard to know which one we, we want to follow up on. You, you started, has anything really changed at all? And then you went on to media and then, you know, there, there's so many things. Um, but this feeling of, we want to support one another and find our people, but we don't want 
to isolate ourselves or to cut ourselves off. And I think T knows a lot about this because she's been, you know, writing columns for a small town paper in a not, you know, bright blue area of this country. So maybe T, you'd like to talk a little about that? Thanks, Jane. Um, by the way, I didn't arrive in Berkeley in a Dodge van in the late 80s. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I live in Central Oregon now. Uh, I was raised in the country, but near Eugene, which was a college town and was, so our whole area was beginning to go from like conservative farming church families, which was a lot like my family. Um, you know, there was a, there was like a little commune next door um, where my, my friend's mom left her husband and went over there and joined them. So there, there were these multiple cultural influences. I grew up near the Oregon Country Fair, for those who know that area. So I have that experience. And then I have a lot of like Bay Area, Portland, Brooklyn, big blue bubble places, and spending a lot of my virtual time on the well, which um, tends to be pretty liberal, progressive, but we also have libertarians and others. I think we've gotten a little more um, over time, there are fewer of us and we tend to be a little more bubbled within the well as, as well as well. So out here in central Oregon, where we moved uh, about nine, almost nine years ago from Portland, uh, it's, a, it's purple territory. It's purple, polka dotted, red, blue, mystery, uh, something like 40% of us in this area are non-affiliated voters, or at least in my district. So there's a lot of people who have strong opinions, but they're not really buying Republican or Democrat, particularly. I'm a NAV myself. Uh, and in this context, um, when I first arrived, well, we lived on the road for a while. So it's 2016, we're living in a little trailer. It's out over there, a little our pod, the five-year-old, me and my husband, traveling around. And even just that process made me realize how bubbled I was. Even though I go back and visit my family multiple times a year out in the country, go to church, Republicans, all of that, I still, it took getting the hell out of Portland and listening and opening my eyes to start addressing the, <laughs> the wild, huge depths of my own judgmentalness and my assumptions which you know, I'm still working on and I'll probably be like this my whole life. But I remember just going, oh, geez, you know, we've been getting so much wrong in Wokelandia. And seeing how these things landed out in the country or in small towns in California where we were visiting, I felt a lot of alarm. And then something I guess that I would, I guess it resembles shame to go, oh, you know, I'm I'm really kind of an asshole. I've known that a while. <laughs> I'm bipolar too, so you know, wow. Um, but just recognizing, like, oh my gosh, I, you know, this is not cool. And then the election, and Donald Trump wins, and I'm in this small town where I kind of know a couple people. I know it's like ranching territory. And it's very snowy out and my kiddo's asleep and my husband's working in Portland and I'm on Facebook posting little pictures of hand baskets because I realized before my Facebook friends that we were losing. <laughs> so, ha ha, hell in a hand basket. So that was lonely and I drank too much cider. Um... And then I went into a very, like earlier on this, I was talking about kind of the long, dark tea time of the soul. And are you willing to go there? Or sometimes we're just forced into it through grief or terror. And so following the 2016 election, I went very deep and I did it very consciously. So uh, mostly what I remember is lying in the bath at night with like one little candle burning and allowing myself to think about 
what had really happened, what my role might have been over the years, me and my friends, my pals, my intellectual groovy elite friends. Um, some of it was meditation. Some of it was more thinky thoughts, but it went very deep and it was really hard and maybe not great for my sanity as someone with bipolar one disorder. Uh, but I went there and I, I, I think now I look back, I'm like, I'm really proud of myself that I went in there and then I came out of it just trying to be more open-minded, trying to reach out to more people and feel some degree of acceptance of them and possibly their point of view, even though I disagreed. So I'd been part of this kind of really partisan, super judgmental, um, woke, whatever culture for so long, like you stop even noticing you're in it. You know, I've been in it since 19, I don't know, 85 or something. And <clears throat> so you don't think you're being horrible and judgmental and you are or condescending. So I, I just, I don't know. I just tried to open up more and um, join in discussions from a little less of a condescending, patronizing point of view, listen to others, um, also to send send the signal out to people that I knew who still were in Berkeley, who still were in San Francisco, New York, Portland, and be like, dude, do you know what you're saying out there to the world? Like uh, Oregon Humanities Magazine, which I've written for and I respect, you know, it had been getting on really the woke bandwagon for quite some time. And I thought that was great until I was traveling around and going, no, 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 put in some more articles about white people and farms or none of these people are going to read it. And that's an exaggeration and, you know, not a fair way of painting everyone. But I, I hadn't thought of all that before because I was in my bubble. What did I care? Um, so it was a big wake up call for me. And people around here would probably tell you that I'm a, you know, liberal columnist, but the liberals get mad at me too, because I, I'm trying not to mollycoddle anybody or just stay within the lines of what you're supposed to say, believe and write. Uh, and I write about a lot of personal experiences and, and stuff with our kids and nature, positive stuff that can appeal to anyone. You know, it's not. I don't write that much about like one particular candidate or uh, an issue. Occasionally, yes, but a lot of it is more like, here's this experience I had, or here I am with my favorite photographer who unfortunately has just passed. Jerry Baldock takes wonderful pictures of the kids. The kids are running around the forest. They're making theater in the forest. I'm writing the article. So I'm trying to draw people's attention to things that we have in common that we all might like. And, not, and, you know, not shying away from too many of the conflicts. Uh, I don't know. And my, my editor at the Nugget newspaper here in Sisters, Oregon, Jim Cornelius, he's, he's very good at doing the balancing act and not letting, now that everybody's so polarized, you know, not letting one side or the other kind of win in the newspaper. And I really, really respect that. And you need a human editor to do that. Your algorithm is not going to fucking figure this out. And your social, your virtual social community all around the world is not going to figure this out because they're not in your local community. The geography forces us to, to accept people who are different from us. And the problem with online siloing is, you know, I mean, I, in the 90s, I wanted that for everybody. Uh, my friend, the writer, uh, Richard Cadry, who's on the well, we used to talk about like this imaginary 16 year old boy in Ohio who didn't have access to all the cool Bay Area things. How, you know, how do we get that to him so that he can experience whatever manga or, you know, some cultural phenomenon? And that happened and that was cool. And then it turned into this shit show. Pardon my French, by the way, I swear all the time. Um, and so the thing about geography and, and sometimes family is that these force us to sit with people who aren't just like us. 
They have different religious beliefs. They have different political beliefs. But can they all enjoy a good potluck together? Do they come together when someone in the community has lost a loved one in a tragedy? They do. And in this community, they definitely do. And it doesn't paper over the differences in opinion, but it reminds all of us, we're human, we're connected, we don't have to have all the same beliefs. It's not a requirement. And in America, when I was a kid growing up, I mentioned in Eugene, the Eugene area, you know, there was definitely tension there between the conservative farmers and the hippie commune people, but it was not like this. People were willing to try to be together and be supportive of each other. I feel there's some of that in my community here. And I think the only way to get there is to turn off your phone. As soon as this podcast is over, turn the damn thing off. Give yourself 48 hours and see what happens. Go next door. Talk to whoever that is. I don't know. That's the only hope that I really see. I have to agree with you about uh, associating with people that come from a different place. Um, I'm a caregiver now for my wife. She has, well, she had for a long time had uh, multiple sclerosis, which was a challenge. And in uh, 2019, she had two breasts and two legs. And today she has one leg. She had you know, multiple surgeries due to various things. And I expected that to be, would turn her into, you know, just a, gibbering mess instead she makes me laugh every single day because she uh, came from a whole different uh family structure that i did she her both sides of her family immigrated from portugal from actually from madeira islands which is a portuguese autonomous country and they came over in the early 20th century, and they were all very strict Catholics. She was a you know, Catholic girl hooking up with this weird hippie guy, and uh, I was living in Oakland at the time, and uh, we had very different views on life. But all of a sudden, we realized that we had a lot of similarities, and we learned to rejoice in the difference of the other, and that's is uh i guess kept us going and she still you know even with uh, her challenges of recovering you know trying to walk again she has a better attitude than i ever would have if i were in that place i'd probably be hiding under a tree stump somewhere in the backyard and not talking to anyone but she'll just talk your ears off so it's there's value to associating with people who don't necessarily agree with you. And with people who have really good attitudes, right? <laughs> was it used to say attitude is everything? <laughs> That's really lovely, Scoop. You know, um, I'm glad you found each other yeah. and are still finding goodness together despite the health challenges. You know, it's kind of interesting. I stumbled onto a thing. Um, I think I this was at uh, the International Symposium on Online Journalism, and somebody spoke about this, and then I discovered it's a project called Braver Angels. Are you familiar with that project? So Braver Angels is trying to overcome polarization by getting people who have different political beliefs to pair up and talk to each other or to get in groups and talk to each other. And they're doing amazing work. And one of the things that uh, that I found was they I think they have a podcast. And I was listening to this podcast episode. It was right after the election, and people were they would have a, a left person and a right person talking about their election experiences. And you know, a lot of us thought that people were going to show up at the polls and that they were going to be fighting and they were going to come to blows and people were going to be scaring other people and carrying guns and all that that was going on people showed up and everybody was congenial and everybody was nice sometimes there was somebody who refused to take their political hat off and they had some issues with that but it turns out that people regardless of where they were in their political beliefs were being nice to each other and friendly with each other and you know i i live in a neighborhood where people don't have the same political beliefs but 
but we're all friendly, you know. And um, I have talked about this a little bit with some of our friends on the well and have found some people who who just can't imagine it. It's like these these people, they voted for a fascist and uh, they're, you know, if you voted for the Nazi, then you're a Nazi kind of thing. You know, all those kind of conversations. I said, how are we ever going to overcome this if people believe that way? What do you think, Jane? Well, I've been following that conversation on the well pretty closely, and it's been going on for a while now, um, even before the election. And, you know, one, one thought that's been in my mind as we've been talking is let's not present the well as such a unified silo. I mean, for me, I it's true. Was, I was put onto the well in 1991. And the first thing that I saw that, that engaged me was a huge debate. And, you know, it was a bigger community then and perhaps a somewhat broader community, but a huge debate about the first Gulf War. And we had, you know, a famous colonel, Dave Hughes, who was in favor of the war. We have a lot of people who were pacifists and everything in between. Uh, we had information. This was, you know, before the World Wide Web graphic interface. It was before AOL existed or CompuServe existed. And we had people sort of porting in by email firsthand journal reports by people who were actually, you know, under bombardment here or there or whatever. And I so valued the breadth of information that I was able to get. And I feel the same way about, you know, in the well where everybody is, you know, ostensibly kind of on the same side, there are these enormous heated disagreements which don't seem to get resolved. And I feel it's a real privilege that I'm able to hear them because no one in my life uh, represents uh, that particular point of view that you just described. And if I weren't able to, you know, um, hear and see these things on the well, I would not be able myself to think about the depth of fear and its connection to rage and hatred and the um, unmalleability of a person in almost any position, you know, very few of us change our minds about much. And I was thinking as T was talking how, you know, during what you're now describing as your obnoxious woke period, T, I got some education from you about what younger people were thinking about how they spoke about things. Um, and you, you expanded my knowledge, even in your old, you know, self that you're now a little bit disowning but you taught me some things and everyone whose voice I can hear, I learn something about the breadth of response. And I also learned something about how conversation, um, how conversations go. You know, do they bring us together? Sometimes yes. Do they divide us? Sometimes yes. What is the, um, if your intention is for all of us to move towards wishing less suffering in the world rather than more suffering in the world, how do you effectively get there? Um, and, you know, these questions do not have simple or single answers, but the descriptions of things like the Better Angels Project or, you know, everybody together at the polls or the descriptions of, you know, the severe breakdown of the sense of community. I feel like I need to know this. And, you know, I'm an introvert. I live a quiet life. I'm trying to stay home and write poems. Instead, I'm often flying around and saying poems or speaking to people. But I don't lead a broad social life. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interior turned life. But because of the times, the era that we all find ourselves in, 
and because of um you know uh, what what has to be looked at right now for all of us my life is immensely larger than it would have been if i were you know say a a chinese hermit monk a thousand years ago living in the mountains writing the truths of that and so you know to my shock i have become you know somebody people think of as a spokesperson in these public realms and it's not what my birth character pointed me toward but it is what the age has created and i know i i wouldn't have been able to do it if it weren't for you know 30 plus years on the well because i also had to learn how to talk there are things you don't work through or articulate if you don't ever have to put them in language in a conversation with other people. And if I was going to speak on the well, I had to not just have my intuitive, you know, emotional, intellectual response to things, but I had to be able to put it into words, to spell it out, to say it in a way that could be heard, answered, corrected, expanded. Um, and I think, you know, the question of our overall conversation is a question of sanity keeping and also a question of resilience. And I do think, I who love silence, even though I'm a writer, I do think that resilience can only be built out of our interactions with the wider world. None of us, you know, a person in perfect solitude would know nothing, think nothing, and quickly die. Um, we are we are all part of this great web of interconnection, and you know even a plant. If you raise a plant in a in a totally protected environment, you they do this with seedlings. You start a seedling in a greenhouse, and then maybe it's going to get large, and you put it in a field. And in between, there is a transformative period when you expose it to some of the blows of existence, and it's called hardening off, mm -hmm. but maybe it should be called um, building resiliency. Um, a plant will grow stronger if the wind buffets it. Its stem will have to grow stronger, and so it will do that. So maybe, you know, we are, we are all in a condition together of being rather buffeted, but the response to that, you know, we, we began, you know, with you saying, what do I think about the the people who only say, um, I, I hate them, I can't talk to them. And, you know, maybe that is one stage of uh, something that will become more uh, in favor of feeling the grief, mm -hmm. feeling the interconnection and feeling the fact that, you know, I have come more and more in my poems and in my life to think of the words shared fate. We live on an earth of shared fates. And I just want to do what I can to witness that in its full dimensionality and to speak into it as I can from uh from permeability rather than from pushing away. But, you know, right now I'm still pretty safe. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, I, ha I have great compassion for those who feel already right now a foreseeable um, deep unsafeness. And I think anybody's emotional response is the information of where their heart and mind are at this moment. You cannot turn away from that. You can only live it through. I think fear is a big driver here of some of the panic, too. Uh, and, <clears throat> and fear is contagious, just like... Um, I think the the little bubbles, the little partisan ideas <clears throat> provide us with spaces in which we feel pretty comfortable sometimes. You know, like you were you were saying, that's a fascist. Um, 
whether or not we know that that particular person has any kind of fascist ideas, they're just willing to suck it up and vote for Donald Trump because they want change in the world, or there's a particular policy that feels important to them. And I feel like the fear can get overly whipped up by either side or all the different sides. And sometimes that's done strategically. And other times it's just part of the echo chamber effect. So I, the minute I heard, I was like, I just want to get out of here. <laughs> just get my Jewish men folk out of here and move somewhere else. I'm sick of this country. What the hell? You know, and then you know, I got to sit on it for a little while and kind of graduate out of that. Um, not in a stupid way, like, you know, know where your passport is, et cetera. But um, I found some of the overwhelming sense of anger, fear, humongous assumptions about our fellow Americans that I was feeling around progressives in my life and online. Uh, something about it didn't ring true for me this time around. Any one of these crazy, awful things can happen, may happen. But that kind of larger swath of just like, let's feed each other's beers. Ah, it's horrible. These people are going to, you know, it's, it gets crazy. It turn, it makes us turn into the monster that we think we're opposing. So I, I find myself really trying to step back from my own potential for fear, darkness, indulgent kind of hysteria when it really may not be called for. Maybe it's just, I, I remember feeling that way about um, the second George Bush. And you know, some of what I was afraid of was right, dude. But um, that doesn't mean that the many people in my family who voted for him are terrible people. It means they have different political beliefs from mine. Can I accept that? Can I have them be human? I think it's harder to have them be human if I'm rooted in fear, even legitimate fear right? It just puts you in a place, especially if there's tons of people running around, ah, you know, you get that mob mentality and it's very easy to do now because of the media situation, social media situation, et cetera. Yeah. I became, no. I became one of those, uh, uh, tough talking, uh, maybe <laughs> or bad talking people during the campaign and uh, mostly I did it through humor because uh, on Facebook, I stopped writing personal things. I, I used to post a lot of just personal stuff, stuff I was doing, projects I was doing. But during uh, the campaign, it became so crazy that I just uh, resorted to posting things that uh, made me smile and maybe punched a little back at, uh, at the you know, forces of Trump. And since it's all over with, I'm, I'm going back now to being more personal in what I write and post because it, it you know, and then the aftermath, I felt a lot, a lot like you did. It was kind of silly to be going so far overboard that, uh, you know, it, almost like you had no way to back away from what you'd been saying. But I found that you can unplug a little bit and uh, try to make your life a little more um, even keeled to, uh, you know, help just get through all of this. You know, as part of my meditation practice, actually, I, I started thinking a lot about fear. Uh, you know, fear is obviously for all of us, it's a terrible thing. And we all contend with it at one point or another. And I wondered, I mean, it, one of the things that you learn in a meditation practice is to kind of be with your fear, you know, and and just kind of let it be there and be present with it. But I also started thinking about, I guess I, my question to myself was, what is the opposite of fear? And, and what might you replace fear with? 
And I think the answer to that is love, however you may think of love or however you may define it or however you, you uh, experience it. Uh, I started a practice of trying to replace the experience of fear with the experience of love. And it, it made a difference. It made a difference. And, and one thing I'm clear about is that so much of what we're seeing that is is uh, creating fear is just fear. Fear creating fear. Fear creates more fear. And it just kind of snowballs, right? And if we can let go of that fear and replace it with something, um, I think that, 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 that that's where the hope is. And, you know, and, well, I was just going to say one other thing is another thing is gratitude. I was remembering Thanksgiving's coming up. Gratitude is important, too. What were you going to say, T? Well, just I think that uh, love and fear are so intertwined. And I think that's the name of Wrench and Bunce's book about hospice and death. Isn't it Love and Fear? Great little book. I think so. Um, I think so. So like love, you know, why are you afraid? You're afraid because you love something. You don't want the planet to turn into a flaming ball of nuclear whatever because you love it. You're worried about LGBTQ people in your community and beyond because you love people and you want them to feel safe. So that's, a, for me, that's something to, I guess, play with um, mentally and emotionally is that fear uh, fear teaches us you know, it shows us where the love is. And um, that sometimes shows us that place, you know, that one place that you're afraid of, like, okay, that's where, that's where the juice is. <laughs> that's the place to go next sometimes, you know, if, you know, if you're feeling healthy enough to, to do it. Yeah, I think it's, it's a terrible time right now for if you're LGBTQ, um, or if you're certain minorities and so forth. I mean, if you're people who are who you have been led to feel are not acceptable to the people who are taking power, and if you feel that they're taking power in such a way that they might roll right over you. And I can't imagine how that would feel. I feel safe partly because I'm a cisgender, heterosexual, white male guy. And um you know, it's not as hard for me to feel safe as it is for somebody who is not one or more of those things. And every time I start talking about how we should not fear, you know, we should we should not go into what's coming with an attitude of fear. But that's so much easier for me to say, you know. Well, one thing I've been thinking about a great deal, and in many ways this goes right back to the first election, the 2016 election. So I have an astonishingly powerful sense of deja vu um, because I had to, you know, sort of meet that and and live through those four years in which certainly, you know, the attacks on environmental protections were undone it felt you know every every week there was another piece of bad news for the protection of the earth and its beings but the 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 larger thing which has been coming to mind is you know for me what i look for for sanity and for resilience is to always want to find the larger perspective you know and so one thing one way of finding larger perspective for me from the night of the 2016 election, I have been reading almost entirely, almost nonstop for eight years, you know, my, 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 the reading that I'm able to choose just as what I do when I'm not reading for another purpose has been either people who lived through dire historical times or books about people living through dire historical times. And, you know, that could be 
uh, the Russian poets who ended up, some of them, you know, disappearing on the way to the Gulag, Ashok Mandelstam, or Akhmatova standing outside of Lubyanka prison, um, hoping she could be able to give a present to her son who was who was incarcerated there. Um, but also just remembering that there is more to our lives than the political dimension of them. You know, take a breath, see the mountain, realize that the cat who's asleep a couple feet to my left here knows nothing of politics um, and that the warmth and happiness or discomforts of his life continue. Um, and so larger and larger perspectives. And one of the things I was thinking of with John's description, um, I wondered uh, not to get too technically Buddhist here, um, but you know there is the entire tradition of metta practice, which comes out of the Vipassana community, which is a meditation in which you begin by wishing well to yourself, and then you move that wishing well out to those you love, and then you move that wishing well out to strangers, people you feel neutral about, and then you move that wishing well out to your worst fear, to your the person who you feel is the most threatening to your own happiness, and you wish them well. Because I do think, you know, you know, what is the opposite of, you know, there's there's lots of opposites to to fear. And love is love is certainly one of them. But another one is, you know, what might be called, and and people have trouble with this. If it's not where you're coming from, it will sound weird, but equanimity, you know, the simple balanced state of being in which you're not so tied into. This is my story that I live inside my skin. Um, this is everyone's story. And if you're not identifying, if what you love isn't in that personal realm that T so eloquently spoke of, you know, yes, what you are, what you are frightened for are threats to what you love. And I've often talked about this, you know, in uh, environmental contexts where you know, I will say we will only work to save what we love. And that's true. If you don't care about the natural world in its abundance and thriving, you won't work to save it. If, if you're an urban person and you don't care, it's not your issue. Something else is your issue. But if you wish, if your definition of we is all of us, is our shared fate, every single one of us, then maybe the only way you can hold that is with this, you know, equanimity infused with the warmth of a sense of kinship, a sense of connection, a sense of, boy, here we are on this tiny blue marble, you know, in space that we all saw the photograph of the very first Earth Day, those of us who are old enough, 1970, there were all these flags with the first photograph of the whole earth. And if that is your definition of we, then we'll simply try to get through this difficult era in which division is being fanned for reasons of power, for reasons of economics, for reasons of, you know, the, the things that I personally am not that you know, I, I've never wanted power. I sort of run the other way from it. I don't even like judging a, a book competition, although I will do it from time to time because it means that someone who writes in a way that resonates for me will, will then get published. But some people, you know, most of the world through most of human history, once we scaled up, you know, past the level of community village in which everyone knew one another, has been organized in some way by hierarchies of power. And I think the antidote to that in a way, you know, to sort of pull in another idea from left field, um, uh, the psychologist, anthropologist Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. And, you know, what he basically said is human beings, they have to be fed. They can't be hungry 
homeless, cold, totally vulnerable. But if you take care of these fundamental things, if a person knows that they are safe, if they know where their next meal is coming from, then they can begin to think about these other levels of caregiving and caretaking of one another and the arts and and the spiritual and you know if you're running from a lion you're probably unless you're a saint are probably not thinking about your spiritual life right at that moment you're just running um if you're the buddha you think oh the lion's hungry give it a meal um and you know that's one of the jataka stories that's equanimity you know I, I I can't say I'm there yet. Um, I, I doubt that I will be there in this or the next ten thousand lifetimes. But equanimity is ah, the lion the lion is hungry. Um, maybe I'll feed it. Um, well, when we got started, uh, we mentioned that this is going to be uh, our pre-Thanksgiving podcast, and uh, I actually celebrate Thanksgiving, even though my family history is Native American. My mother was Choctaw from Oklahoma, my dad Irish and Cherokee. And I was raised among those family members who live in Durant, Oklahoma, which was the, basically the uh, Choctaw capital. And my grandmother was uh, educated in what was called Indian Girls School. Her and her friends were sent off. They were not allowed to speak Choctaw unless they went and hid out in the forest uh, <laughs> and said it among themselves. But they celebrated Thanksgiving. And some people think that was, well, that, that's just silly because that's not really a Native American holiday. Well, you know, the day after Thanksgiving is Native American Heritage Day. So <laughs> we, we celebrate both. Because my grandmother said, there's no reason to be disrespectful to your neighbors. If they are thankful, then you should be thankful for them as well. And every culture on earth has a harvest festival, you know, to be grateful for the summer's bounty that will help us through winter. This is not culturally, you know, mediated. Every human being on earth who lives in a place with seasons um, there is some version of a Thanksgiving. And I do think, you know, you bring up a really important point, and I love the family story. I didn't know that about you. Um, but, you know, gratitude is another source of resilience and another antidote to fear. Um, I, wrote, I wrote a little something about that, you know, just this morning, not using the word gratitude, but the fact that, you know, I can, when it gets cold, I have a wool blanket and I can put it on my bedding and be warmer. This is amazing. What luck. I have a wool blanket. I was no. going to, Oh, go I, ahead. I know we just have a couple minutes. I was going to ask if each person could take like, I, I guess, two minutes, one minute, and just say something concrete that you've been doing to help get through this post-election period so far? You know, like if you go on a five mile jog every day or you sit on your cushion or just, just something we could tell each other or maybe an idea that might help somebody else. John, you go first. Well, the thing that I realized that I might do is coming from a community perspective because I've spent so much time with online community and really have thought so much about how people can relate to each other. Um, and one of the things that I'm focusing on, I'm trying to have to get better at understanding the dynamics of, of human interactions, I guess. I think w one thing that I realize about the state that we're in now is that you know, for most of human history, we haven't really known a whole lot about what whole masses of other people are thinking. And now we're exposed to it big time via the Internet. So the Internet has taken us into a whole different kind of reality. And and that is part of the challenge. And people becoming aware of what other people are thinking 
for some people, it's difficult. It's sort of difficult to assimilate that. It's difficult to accept that some people could be so much different, so different that from me that, that, you know, it seems like an alien, almost alien thing to me. So how do you get people to find that sense of comfort and safety with each other? And I think that that's partly achievable through community. And we've talked about that a little bit today. And one of the things I've been working on is just kind of getting some conversations together and kind of the goal being to think how you could create a recipe for community kind of and and distribute that and help people to get into um, contexts of relationship that that are uh, that sort of overcome the the polarization of the moment. So that's mine. Jay? Well, I, I can't say that there's anything new because I have been responding to what we are meeting now uh, in very explicit ways for the last eight years. Um, and so, you know, you're asking for one concrete thing, but, you know, everything you've named, I go out every afternoon into, into you know, the wider world. And and in the last light, I'm outside looking at the plants. I, I wake up every morning and uh, continue the practice I've been doing for a long time now of the first thing I open my eyes to, I say, you beauty, um, the Australian exclamation of happiness. And I continue to read because I want insight into other people's experiences of a changing and difficult world and how, how you live in it. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a single answer because, you know, just recalibrating the compass and continuing to wish to be of service however I can. Thank you. Scoop. Well, let me show. Uh, let me switch cameras here, and I'll show you what I've been doing. If I can get the right camera going. Come on, camera. Whoops. No. Oh, <laughs> it helps if I don't cut the. Yep. Okay. I can't even do my own own equipment here. Now, that's the wrong camera. Here's the one. Right here is what I've been doing. This is my uh, long-term favorite piece of uh, studio gear. It's a reel-to-reel, -reel, uh, professional reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And over my long career, I've created a lot of audio tape, a lot of audio productions. And I haven't really touched any of that. I put them up at the shelf up here and forget about them. I'm reliving all of those. I'm transferring all of this stuff that's on reel to reel and VHS tape to digital and seeing what it's like now. And I was, I've unearthed a lot of great memories and things I might even roll into our podcast. I found a great thing up with my friend, Paul Krasner, the editor of the realist, a fine human being that I got, got to know him over, uh, uh, long dinners at the Hunan Cafe, the original Hunan Cafe in San Francisco. And he would tolerate it because I loved, uh, my friends and I loved you know, the really spicy Chinese food. And Paul was one of those people that tolerated it. But I'm going to you know, roll out something that he wrote about his work with Lenny Bruce. I found a bunch of other great stuff. So that's how I'm re regaining my uh, composure is you know, re revisiting past crimes, I guess you'd say. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. we have got Close to the end out. of the yeah, we've got to the end of the hour, and I really want to thank you for joining us today. This, this has been such a great conversation. Thank Anybody you, else? John and yeah. Scoop for having us here. It's um, it's nice to see and talk to you instead of just typing to you. <laughs> And I love looking through your window there. I am very, very fortunate to have this view as long as it doesn't burn down around our ears, which is pretty likely at this point. Yikes. Well, we'll have to do this again soon. Great yeah. gratitude to you, to you each and all. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And we will see you soon. Okay. Bye. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.